Yes, indeed, folks, you are tuned into Blue Please here on Wow Radio with myself, Total Biscuit. Right, let's get straight on with it. But first, yes, let's get straight on to it. But first, quick shout out must go out to my old school guild. I say old school because I've only been in there for a couple of days, and yet the last time I was in there was in 2006, I believe. Lethe on Masrigo, EU Horde side. Oh, yes, we be clearing and. Those nubs be dying on Thaddeus because they need to learn to play. Ah, they're slacking. That's what they are. Not impressed. Oh well. I'm sure they'll get the idea when they get slapped about a bit in on DPS meters. By real measures! Yes. I remember when DPS could only be done by the truly hardcore, not you scrubs and your crazy Honda pets. Ah, 6,000 DPS by... Hitting steady shot over and over again? No! Preposterous! Inconceivable! Anyway, yeah. We're actually recruiting, by the way, so if you want to check us out, then go uh, Google Lethe Guild or head to the Masrigo Realm Forums. You might want to get involved in that particular guild because we be ready for Ulduar. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking very much forward to it. Now, Another guild that I'm a member of, of course, is Arcanist Belt, which has come up quite a little bit over the last few months. It's our level 60 rating guild on Anachronous, and it's our... It's kind of like a history project. It's like going back in time to have a look at the way that instances used to be and attempt to play them in the most authentic way possible, i.e. stick to level 60, use only pre-TBC gear, only pre-TBC talents where possible, we've got no Shaman, we've got no Death Knights, etc., etc., now, we entered our second raid, which was, of course, AQ-20. The first raid involved a full clear of Zulka Rope, which was very successful. And then we took a couple of weeks holiday because of various things like Valentine's Day and all that stuff. And then we came back and we did AQ-20, which proved to be relatively challenging and rather enjoyable. Now, every time we're going to clear one of these instances, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a retrospective. And the purpose behind that retrospective is because I think we forget a lot of the time where a lot of the mechanics that we're now encountering actually came from in the first place. I think it's pretty important that we keep that in mind and see how far we've come. Now, AQ-20 was, of course, released alongside AQ-40 with the Shifting Sands, Terror of the Sands, I can't remember what it's called. But yeah, it was the Anchorage patch. Huge world event, two instances both of which had to be unlocked by doing the world event and doing the war effort, which involved basically collecting a lot of peace bloom, which is rather ironic, to say the least. However, AQ-20 was, and still is, in my opinion, a relatively well-designed instance. There are a few things I do not like about it, but it is still pretty solid. Now, I first got to play this instance back in 2005 at BlizzCon. They actually had it on beta there. We got to play it, and we got to be geared up in all sorts of things. And it was pretty fun. And I remember doing the first few pulls. I actually remember playing a healer, and I was really bad at it. And I've never attempted to play a healer ever again. I think I spammed Great Heal over and over again and went oom. I, I don't know what I'm doing as a healer. I, I do depths. That's what I do. Now, I like to go through boss by boss and also have a look at the trash. And compare it to some of the stuff we're now encountering, and we might find some rather interesting conclusions. Now, initially, of course, there is a bunch of horrible, horrible patrolling trash, which really don't add anything in particular to the raiding scene. It was mostly generic kind of trash. Nothing particularly exciting there. The exciting trash came later. Now, first boss that you deal with is Kuranax. Kuranax is a big sand, worm, centipede kind of thing. He has a bigger brother called Fancrus, which can be found in AQ-40, and Kuranax is a relatively decent challenge for those who kind of suck at the game. Otherwise, he's not particularly hard. Now, the mechanics of Kuranax are something that I don't recall ever really being repeated, although it did introduce the idea, well, not so much introduce the idea, but it certainly brought to the fore the idea of stand out of the fire. Now, of course, there had been other mechanics based around Stand Out of the Fire, such as Magmadar, that had Stand Out of the Fire. We could also talk about Baron Geddon, which was Stay Away from the Fire, and stuff like that. But this really did bring the idea of Get Out of the Fire and Stay Out of the Fire into the forefront as regards to raiding. Now, the mechanic behind it was called Sand Trap, and Sand Trap would come up from beneath the sand, as you might expect. 
And if you were standing in the AOE range of the bubble when it burst, you would be silenced for 20 seconds. Of course, that being an absolute killer for anybody who was attempting to heal. If all your healers got sand trapped, you were pretty much dead on the spot. Didn't help the Kumanax also did a lot of damage. It also did a 75% hit reduction on melee characters. So the tanks couldn't hit, therefore couldn't build threat. The DPS couldn't do anything. Pretty much standing in a sand trap was a bad thing. It was imperative that you got out of them. It really was. Not so much like, say, the fires on Magmadar. You probably wouldn't die from those. You might take a bit of damage, but these were absolutely imperative. Very interesting mechanic and caught a lot of people off guard initially. It also had a mechanic whereby you had to swap tanks due to stacking debuffs. Naturally, you saw stacking debuffs later on in Naxxramas and in various other instances. The idea of stacking debuffs is an interesting one. Switching tanks is interesting, although of course it did require at least two and preferably three tanks in order to properly perform this particular encounter. It also had a 30% in rage, which is something that you will also find in other parts of the instance. There is a percentile based in rage on a couple of the bosses. Otherwise, it didn't really add all that much. Now, what was interesting here is that the second boss came directly after the first. And the second boss is what introduced a very intriguing new mechanic into the game, which was used for an entire instance later on. And those of you who know the encounter I'm talking about will know that it is General Rajax. Now, General Rajax had a couple of interesting mechanics. And a lot of these have been duplicated. He was based on waves. The entire encounter was based on waves. You had to fight various waves of trash, which came at various different intervals and consisted of various different monsters, including mini-bosses, and then you get to fight the end boss. It was an endurance fight, the likes of which had not really been seen before. Now, it also introduced the idea of NPCs. NPCs that would help you in the fight. Now, Waves and NPCs with a boss at the end. Can somebody please tell me which instance that sounds like to you? You get 10 seconds to answer that question. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Have you answered the question? The answer, you should know, is Mount Hygel. The entire instance is based on that principle. The entire instance. Where do you think it came from? AQ20. There are NPCs that help you, but if they die, you, there is something bad happens. In the case of a, of Mount Igel, if the main NPCs die, you actually lose, which kind of sucks. In this case, you end up losing out on certain things. Now, keeping the NPCs alive was, hmm, how do I put this? A little bit hard. And of course, the modus operandi of the fight was to attempt to keep these NPCs alive because they would give you a particular buff. They would also give you extra loot. But keeping them alive was hard. Hmm. I wonder what that sounds like to you. Yes, indeed. Another example of the prototype hard mode. More refined. More refined than the version that we found in Zulgarup which involved Takar and not killing his priests. There was no good reason not to kill his priests. They gave extra loot, and you didn't gain any extra loot for killing Hakar while the priests were up. However, they took the concept, they changed it, they introduced it into Rajax with NPCs. If you kept the NPCs alive, you gained more rep, and you gained the ability to buy special items. So yes, you did technically get extra loot. The evolution of the hard mode is very interesting to see because you see it. Every now and again it crops up in those instances. And you can see the evolution of the idea. I find that very intriguing. Now, on to the next boss. Now, this boss, I... I'm trying to think of any boss that's even close to this. Fe feel free to let me know in the IRC or email me at themelokagmail.com if I'm simply missing something. But Burrow the Gorger. Burrow the Gorger, one of my favorite encounters. It's wonderful. It has the Fixate mechanic. Now, Fixate has been used in certain other encounters bef before. Of course, Zulgaro being a prime example. There are a couple of others, as I recall. 
The idea of fixating this encounter was this particular encounter was untankable. Yes, it was. Were there any encounters before that that were untankable? Well, think about it. Molten Core, anything untankable? No. Unless you count Ragnaros, which I don't. How about Zulgarub? Anything untankable in there? Not really, no. So yeah, it was the first example of an untankable encounter. The idea being that no, you could not simply tank and spank it. AQ20 moved away from tanking and spanking in a lot of different respects. And that's a very good thing, I must say. It was a fight based on movement, and there weren't all that many of those. In fact, I can barely think of any. There are two particular encounters that, in fact, possibly three, that really involve a lot of movement in AQ20. This was the first, Boo the Gorger. You had to pull Boo the Gorger over eggs, and you had to burst those eggs while he was over them. Yes, indeed. It, the only real way to do damage was to utilize objects within the world that were specifically placed there for that purpose. Tricky. Very tricky indeed. Rather unique mechanic. He also had the best enrage that anyone's ever come up with, where his head pops off at 20%, and you have to DPS him down as a plague progressively kills your raid. A DPS race of the highest caliber. In my opinion, Boru is a perfect encounter. There is nothing wrong with Boru the Gorger at all. It is in concept absolutely perfect. Now, to the next encounter. Moem. The evil, evil Obsidian Destroyer type thing. Moan was a relatively easy encounter, which involved a lot of mana draining. If you do not mana drain, and of course this was something that was introduced to some degree in Zul'Garub, mana draining was done in Zul'Garub because some of the stuff was quite unpleasant, and you could disable its abilities far easier than you could say in Molten Core, where the mana reserves would be absolutely enormous. We're talking like 200, 300,000 mana, whereas the stuff in Zul'Garub had more like 15 to 20k mana, which was easily drainable. If you did not drain Moan, Moan would explode and do a hideous amount of damage to everyone. Aside from that, Moan really didn't do anything all that interesting. It was a mana draining fight, which back in the day, when replenishment did not exist, was a relatively big drain on your raid. It was, to some degree, a DPS race, because the magic users would run out of mana if you were not too careful. Other than that, nothing particularly notable. Now, the final encounter. I'm going to miss out AMS the Hunter, because, to be honest, I don't care about AMS the Hunter... AMS the Hunter's got like 20-30 minutes of trash before it, you need a Hunter to tank it, nobody cares. So let's ignore AMS the Hunter in favour of the more interesting boss that is of course Assyrian. Assyrian is a masterfully designed encounter. But before that, we had the Anubisath Warriors, the big Anubisath Guardian things, huge things. And you'd see them again in AQ40, but these, these were like core hounds on crack. They had a variety of different abilities which involved, of course, a lot of movement. There was a devouring plague that could spread to other members of the raid unless you moved away from the raid very quickly. There was a war stomp, which meant that you had to keep out of melee range. They all could also summon adds. They could explode. And they could bring down meteors on the raid, which would be spread damage. Therefore, you'd have to clump up in order to avoid them. They also had a resistance, indeed a reflection, to particular schools of magic. And they could have any combination of those abilities, which was pretty awesome. Very good example of very interesting and intriguing trash. Admittedly, there are and still are way, way, way too many of those in the final room. Now, let's talk briefly about Assyrian and why this fight was just so masterfully done. Again, another movement-based fight. This fight was based on timing and it was based on scouting. The amount of situational awareness required in this fight is, in my opinion, second to none. There are very few encounters that even come close. This is the only fight that I can think of where you had to make use of the entire huge arena and you had to have somebody out riding and scouting for crystals. The idea being that you dragged a Syrian from crystal to crystal, he would start in supreme mode which would one shot the tank, the only way to get rid of the supreme mode was to activate a crystal nearby. The crystals would spawn in random locations, you had to kite him from one crystal to another and all the while there were tornadoes going off in the arena. And he could do war stomps and envelop people in wind. I do knockbacks and all manner of interesting, intriguing stuff. Perfect example of a fight that required an awful lot of movement. Very dynamic, very interesting, a complete and total departure from Tank and Spank. And indeed, in my opinion, AQ20 was the biggest departure from Tank and Spank that we saw at that stage in Classic WoW. And I think a lot of lessons have definitely been learned there to make fights a little bit more interesting. We've seen a lot more movement-based fights. We saw a lot more in Nax. We saw some in AQ40. We continue to see them all the way through TBC and indeed into Wrath. And we can no doubt see a lot more fights that will involve a lot more movement. Less tanky-spanky. That is a good thing. 
My conclusion, AQ20 is still pretty much as fun as it was. A little bit too much trash, a lot of very interesting encounters. I'm looking forward to going back in there again to get some sand-polished hammers. Oh, yes. Base rogues know what I be talking about. My name is Tall Biscuit, and you are listening to the one and only Blue Please here on WoW Radio. I'm going to play some music. It shall be cheesy, it shall be awesome, it shall be Ed Guy. And I have so much of this. I really do. Which one should we choose? I have no idea. This one will do. I'll be right back after this, folks. Enjoy. Enjoy. 